Unikisak. I'm Stephanie again for both Apex Languages and Gapanova School, and this is Weekly Wordplay. Happy Thanksgiving to y'all! What you just heard was Good Day in the language of the Wampanoags, an indigenous Native American tribe that first encountered the Pilgrims, a hapless band of English religious outcasts who arrived in modern-day Massachusetts in 1620. They had actually been planning to settle in sunny Virginia, but somehow wandered way off course and ended up in New England in December. Yeah, nearly half of their small group died that first winter, and come spring, things weren't much better because they were completely unprepared. Fortunately, the Wampanoag stepped in, taking pity on the fools. They taught them how to plant corn, catch fish, and forage for wild nuts and berries. In return, as the story goes, the grateful pilgrims invited their new Native American friends to a great harvest banquet, which we Americans continue to honor every year on the fourth Thursday in November. And everyone lived happily ever after. Of course, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to find out that the true story was a lot more complicated, bloody, and heartbreaking. Nonetheless, Thanksgiving remains my favorite holiday because of what it stands for, in theory at least. Christmas is right around the corner, and all the greed-filled materialism that goes along with it. But at least for Thanksgiving, we pause to appreciate the things and people we already have. We give thanks. And if you're interested in reviewing 17 different ways to do that, check out last year's video featuring the word grateful. The link's down below. This year, I want to share my gratitude by honoring those who came before, highlighting a few dozen words like powwow that we borrowed into English from Native American languages. To be fair, by the time the Europeans first started arriving in the New World, we had plenty of words of our own to cover the basic necessities of life. Hundreds of new indigenous words flooded into English, some indirectly through French and Spanish, of course, but most were admittedly a bit limited, describing previously unknown plants and animals. Many, many more were adaptations of old place names. Nonetheless, English certainly would have been a much poor language if we weren't able to drive our learners crazy with, for example, the silent O and possum, the identical plural form of moose, or tongue twisters like how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood. We also inherited a variety of new terms to describe big cats, including jaguar, which the British suddenly mispronounced Jaguar, they are Jag sometimes, and Cougar, which is also what you call an older woman trying to date a younger man. Nahuatl, in particular, the language of the Aztecs in modern-day Mexico, gave us a lot of food words. There's avocado, which they also use to describe their testicles, similarly to how we use nuts today. Tomato, potato, or is that tomato, potato? Jerky, dried meat, comes from the Quechuans in South America, and pumpkin was actually borrowed from those same Wampanoags who helped the pilgrims. Pumpkin can also be used as a cute pet name for your beloved child or partner. In some areas, like the South, they might use it on anyone. How can I help you today, pumpkin? Jerks, on the other hand, aren't loved by anyone. Maybe it's because they like to jerk off so much. Look it up. Speaking of terrible vices, now we come to the fun words. Tobacco was, of course, quote-unquote, discovered by Columbus when he first met the Taino Indians. And what's tobacco without a cigar? Sadly, it would be more than 300 years until he could try tequila, so-called after a town in Mexico with a Nahuatl name. Around the same time, interestingly, a little further south, European scientists were isolating cocaine from the mild coca plant for the first time, a word which, again, came from Quechua. Oh boy, what a party! What more could you need? Except chocolate, of course. 
That was discovered by Cortez, not Columbus, and in beverage form because the word cacahuatl literally meant chocolate bean water. Finally, Native American words occasionally describe geographical features like K or Bayou, or even some weather events like hurricane. But where they really shine are local place names. The list of lakes, rivers, mountains, cities, and even countries bearing some adaptation of an indigenous word goes on and on. This is true for roughly half of the U.S. states, from Alabama to Wyoming. Of particular note, I like Hawaii, or as the natives call it, Hawaii, place of the gods, and Iowa, land of the sleepy ones. For a little closer inspection, we turn first to powwow. Say that with me, powwow. To the New England Algonquins, this term actually referred to a holy medicine man, literally meaning one who dreams. Not unlike the ancient Greeks, these Native Americans would regularly hold elaborate ceremonies from everything from curing the sick to seeking divine blessing for a successful hunt. At the center was always the powwow, whom English speakers mistook for the name of the gathering itself. When talking about Native Americans, this word evokes dancing and singing and smoking, but the modern day equivalent is much more professional in nature, although still relatively informally, as in from coworker to coworker. You could see that from the following sentence. You can't go in there right now. The chiefs are having an important powwow. This can technically also be used as a verb to have a powwow or to confer, as in the second sentence. I'm not sure. We'll powwow about it and get back to you once we've made a decision. Very closely related, in fact, from the same language, is our next word, caucus. Repeat that caucus. The caucusu was the elder of those powwow meetings, another highly respectable position, and modern caucuses reflect that status. The term can either refer to a group, usually of the highest ranking members in a political party, especially those who share a similar purpose, or the private secretive meetings they hold to make major decisions. You're most likely to hear this around presidential election season every four years when parties vote separately for who will be their final candidate representing them. In 2020, for example, that came down to Donald Trump and Joe Biden. But it can be used more generally as well. For example, I've got two sample sentences for you here. The Speaker of the House continued to support the president despite calls from the rest of his caucus to start impeachment proceedings. As in, the rest of his fellow leading Democrats or Republicans or whatever political parties you have in your country. Next, I'll demonstrate how this can also be used, again less commonly, as a verb, meaning to hold a caucus meeting. They're almost done caucusing now, but we won't know the results from the caucus until the big Senate vote later. Now for something completely different. Shack, repeat that, shack, surprisingly comes from Mexican Nahuatl again. Its meaning hasn't changed much. It's still a cramped, run-down, rustic place to call home, or maybe a simple shed for your tools in the backyard. For the poverty-stricken wretches who are too poor to afford a backyard, though, there's nothing cozy about a shack. This word has a definitively negative connotation. All six of them live together in a tiny tin roof shack with no electricity or running water. As for the verb meaning, ever hear of the song Love Shack? Be careful, because if someone asks you to shack up, that preposition is the key. They are either asking you to move in and live with them or offering to have sex. My guess is, if you don't know this person, it's more likely to be the second option, but let's play it safe and assume the former. Despite their parents' disapproval, they've been shacking up together for over three years. 
One final sentence for you. The husky cannibal relaxes on a hammock outside his shack overlooking the savanna while a Yankee buccaneer barbecues along with some squash over the fire. Oh dear, a Yankee myself, I hope that buccaneer is only cooking the meat instead of being the meat. Darn ambiguity. What do all those words in blue have in common? Would you believe that they all originated as Native American words as well? Let me finish up real quick with your idiom of the week, talk turkey. It means to discuss something in a straightforward manner, and is most commonly used in a business setting, like here in our sample sentence. Let's quit beating around the bush. Come into my office so we can talk turkey and find you a price that you'll love. In other words, let's cut the crap and just say what we mean. Talking turkey means that you're really getting down to the business of negotiation. One last idiom that will come in handy this holiday season, gobble up. Normally, gobble gobble is the sound that a turkey makes, but here it means to eat hastily, as in you're in a big rush or haven't eaten in a week. You're such a pig. Stop gobbling up your food. It's frequently used metaphorically as well, as in you want more and more of something, clearly do excess. You just can't get enough. Obsessed with the disease, they gobbled up any news they could find, not caring to check their sources. As for our practice, let's get political. Nothing bad could come of that, right? Do you think political caucuses should be allowed to powwow in private, or should they always be forced to talk turkey in public? Share your thoughts below in the comment section, or feel free to practice any of the other vocabulary we've learned this week. That's it for me. Until next time, have a wonderful Thanksgiving feast, if you celebrate it, and gobble up an extra slice of pie for me. An extra special thanks for watching.